Hi there. Uh, this is Angelo John Lewis for the Sacred Inclusion Network. Um, in case you're not familiar with us, the network is a group of people that are interested in exploring the intersection between difference or diversity and spirituality. And if you want to know more about us, please visit our website, sacredinclusion.com. Today, it's my privilege to interview Heidi Campbell, who's a professor of communications at Texas A&M University. She's an authority on the intersection of media, religion, and culture, with a special interest in the internet and digital and mobile culture. She's written a number of books, including When Religion Meets New Me Media and Digital Religion, Understanding Religious Practice in New Media Worlds. Um, Heidi Campbell, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. You know, um, Heidi, I always like to ask people um, to give me to start off by giving me a sense of your own sort of um, religious spiritual journey, and if at all it, inter it interacts with your principal research subject. So um, I was kind of raised by parents that I describe as kind of postmodern spiritual pilgrims before that was a thing. So my um, I was raised in the Christian tradition, but my mom was raised kind of very um, main mainline Lutheran church, and my dad Presbyterian. And when I was very young, they had a kind of conversion experience um, and a, a kind of an evangelical conversion experience. And so they had this conversation saying, well, if we grew up in these two traditions and we hadn't heard this part of the, the Christian story, what else are we miss, missing? So growing up between, you know, I age of about three years old and about going off to college, my parents purposely changed churches and denominations every, you know, one to three years. So by the time I got to college, um, you know, I'd been in about at least a, 12 different kinds of churches. And I basically been trained from, you know, a very young to be a sociologist of religion. I mean, you know, being able to understand, how, you know, how does this community worship? What is their kind of basic liturgy and practice? What are the kind of rituals that I need to kind of decode? And I became very adept at that. And so I think that kind of opened my interest in just kind of trying to look at religious traditions in general um, from that kind of upbringing. And how did the internet come, come into all that, if at all? Well, I went in um, uh, 1996, I had moved to Scotland to do a master's. Um, the master's degree was a special program in media ethics um, and um, religious studies. And um, when I got there, 96 was the time when the internet became a public commodity. And so we had to do kind of a, um, an essay for one of my classes on kind of like future directions of religion and media research. And I remember reading a couple articles in newspapers about this idea of virtual communities and a virtual church. So I um, did that as my essay, and that kind of opened the door to do PhD work in that area. So um, I've been studying kind of the intersection between digital media, religion, and um, digital technologies um, since the, the mid-1990s, about 25 years. And you're quite quite prolific. Um, you've got like um, you you just write about. You've written so many different things. So I was uh, I, I sampled a little bit and I, I got exhausted just reading all the different things. But at least at least it gave me a flavor of what you're about. Now you know um, there's a, there's kind of like a kind of a chorus of different people that say that um, because we're living in a in a kind of a digital age, um, that kind of coequates to a decline in religious and an increasingly secular society. I have a sense that you have a different take on that. I wonder if you could just um, explicate that a little bit. Yeah, the internet, um, uh, a lot of people have been talking about the idea of the secularization thesis for, you know, the last 20 years. And um, thinking that, you know, as we're moving a more globalized society, open to more opinions and ideas that, you know, we might be moving more secular. Um, but actually people have found, and, you know, there was several interesting books uh, written in the early days in the 90s. Um, one was, uh, called the pearly gates of cyberspace um, and this was she was a, a art historian um, that wrote about how like the cathedrals you know in the medieval period kind of gave people this virtual reality experience and how that might be similar to these new versions of cathedrals and churches that are forming online um, and you know again she well, she was the first person where i kind of saw her challenging the the secularization thesis with kind of looking at the internet saying that you know what this does is it in some ways allows people to kind of re uh, engage with spiritual parts of their lives. You know, it used to be if you want to check out Buddhism or you know um, Judaism, you have to you know meet with a rabbi, go to that religious community. But the internet allows you to kind of you know um, dip in and do kind of ethnography in many different communities and traditions without actually um, having face-to-face -face contact. Um, and um, the um, I, I kind of found that it, that people 
actually, you know, um, are really kind of curious in this kind of, you know, digital era, era. I think the one thing that does happen is that, you know, it used to be religion was kind of the primary centering point of society and culture. And so religion was what kind of set the boundaries, it set the laws, it set, set the morals. Um, now religion is just one of many kind of ideologies that people draw from. So it's not the only discourse partner, but I think religion where sometimes in the sidelines, maybe in the 60s and 70s, um, and especially academics in the 90s and 2000s has come up to be kind of place and an area for definitely paying attention to. And even religious studies scholars say that, yeah, hey, we have to pay attention to the internet because people, how they practice religion and understand is being mediated through digital technology. And so I think, you know, you know, there, there are people, we are moving in some areas, especially Europe, towards secularization, but it's still making religion a, a place of conversation. And what religion does in the digital areas, areas kind of get redefined rather than fade away. Well, um, this is maybe a, a little bit of a, um, I'm going to see if I can articulate this a little bit. So, um, so when you look at studies like the Pew people have done, they've done lots of different studies and talks about sort of the decline of people or the, the, the rise of people that call themselves nuns, for example. And, and, and sort of built into that is a kind of, um, it's not like they're not religious as, as much, um, but they're more interested in spirituality as religion so, than, than religion. So uh, I wonder how does that, how does that kind of, um, how does that fit into what you're, what you're attempting, to, attempting to explain to me? So um, you know, scholars of religion, we use kind of there's these two categories that we look at um, or how religion is practiced in kind of postmodern digital society. So, you know, what, usually when you say religion, people think of a specific religious tradition and especially uh, um, a, an organized form of religion is tied to a specific church, denomination, structure, community. But um, scholars of religion are finding that people kind of practice religion, what we call lived religion. So they may say, oh, I'm, you know, Jewish, I'm Christian, um, but they draw on multiple sources to kind of define what that means. So they're not just drawing on one, one tradition or one denomination to do that expression. So religion is much more kind of personalized um, in the digital age. And that's kind of, you know, what, what I was saying online is that, you know, you can go one place and get your, go to an online prayer retreat and you can go here to get your uh, resources. And here you can have a spiritual meditation community. Um, and it allows for much more flexibility. So what you see kind of is the rise of what they call, you know, the spiritual but not religious. Um, so they're saying, you know, hey, I have a religious identity, but maybe it's a conglomeration like I'm a Jubu, a Jewish Buddhist. Or maybe it's, um, you know, I describe myself a Christian, but I also believe in reincarnation. So it's much more flexible and not tied to the specific denomination. And the other thing that we're seeing in people that, you know, kind of in, uh, that kind of just describe themselves as not religious is that they're still religious. It's just not in the traditional sense of what we think religion is. You know, we think religion as a set, you know, as kind of a set of, of doctrines and dogmas coming from a specific divine source or, or leader. Um, but um, scholars also study what they call, we call implicit religion. So there's a lot of things in contemporary culture that bear a family resemblance to religion. And that could be, you know, anyway, thing from, you know, people in Silicon Valley saying, you know, the internet is a religion because it gives me a transcendent meaning of life. It associated with a certain set of beliefs and those are lived out in certain practices. Um, for some people, implicit religion is sports fandom. So, but there's a lot of things in contemporary society that people use to give them a religious kind of um, feeling and kind of practice a sense of a meaning in their life. Um, but it's not, again, drawing on the uh, world religions tradition. Yeah, so it's not confined to these, these, um, these edifices of, of meaning, let's say. You know, you mentioned a word in there, uh, which I think is very sort of um, interesting in this particular time, which is community. You know, so um, people are not going, even people who are churchgoers, they can't go to church right now. And so um, this kind of virtual community has more meaning. So I'm wondering what your sense as to how the, how's, how's the, inter, how's the internet impacted um, what we mean by community? Is it just simply an extension of it? Or is it something, has it changed it in any other kind of radical way? Well, I think, you know, especially in the last month, this has become a big debate. What is religious community online? What is a church online? And so there is a lot of churches that um, you know, maybe were either digitally hesitant or, you know, they were had an older congregation and they weren't really tech savvy. But they've all, because of the kind of, you know, sheltering in place um, uh, rules and kind of um, boundaries, you know, people are forced in the last month to go online if we want to still have a service and, and meet. 
Um, and so people, you know, I think, especially in this first month, have really focused on uh, how do I use um, a YouTube <laughs> channel? You know, what does it mean to have a Zoom? You know, should I do Zoom or should I do Facebook? Um, you know, live streaming, you know, a lot of technical things. But I'm seeing conversations going on going, ah, well, just because we put a camera in the church and we have the priest standing in front and we're filming, filming the event that is a worship service, or even if we mix it up a little bit and like turn it more into a talk show format where, you know, the pastor's kind of sitting in his living room and he um, has these guests in, which are kind of members of the staff to talk about the pandemic. Um, it's still kind of a broadcast model and people are saying, wow, people are still, um, you know, they're able to attend church, but it's not very interactive experience. And this is getting people to reflect both on a, maybe our offline church isn't very communal or interactive. Maybe we've turned religion into a structured event and not into a community. And the second thing is people are beginning to say, well, well how do you actually cultivate community online? What, what are the traits people look for? And um, I just wrote an article that, um, um, summarizing my research um, because, you know, 25 years ago, I did this study that was my PhD, and I found that there was like six traits that people want out of community online. You know, they, the reason someone would go in an email group or a news group or an alternate uh, reality environment is because they were looking for relationship. They stayed because they got con intimate communication and connection with people. They felt their contribution was valued in that group, um, what they gave, and, and they also felt that um, uh, they were cared for in some way. Um, and these are the traits that we want out of community anyways, but a lot of these people said, I feel this more online because community online is based on conversation and it's text-based. So if you don't say anything, you're pretty much absent. So <laughs> you have to communicate to be part of the community. And I think, you know, I'm uh, calling a lot of, you know, especially religious leaders and say, hey, this is what people want. They, and they want this in the context of a shared faith conversation and, um, and space where they can live and grow with people. How do you actually do that online? And so I think we're in the next month, we're going to see a lot of interesting, again, experiments, not just on the practical side, but what does it mean to build community, um, especially when we can't leave our homes? Yeah, yeah. So this is an interesting time for all of us in that regard. You know, I guess um, sort of part and parcel with the thing about community, for me, religion means rituals in a certain sense. You know, it's like I go to mass, um, you know, I have this, these things that I do every day, which sort of define me as far as meaning and belief and all that sort of thing. So, um, as you know, there's lots of different sort of, um, I'll call them online rituals. Um, but but let, let's just talk a little bit more general. Um, how does uh, sort of digital technology I influence ritual? Um, does it change it in any way or is it simply just a new form, a different form that's sort of an extension of face-to-face -face ritual? Well, I... Uh, um... You know, I've been studying kind of religious rituals, anything from within the Jewish community, like how do they do, you know, uh, um, uh, put boundaries around technologies for Shabbat or um, how uh, do, you know, you do like a minyan um, online, as well as looking at kind of, you know, Christian and, Islam and Muslim tradition about technology. And I found that two, there's two traits that are kind of pretty consistent with how people practice rituals online, no matter what the tradition. One is this idea of convergent practice. Um, and I've already touched on it briefly, but the convergent practice is the idea that people use digital technology um, to to kind of uh, replicate or or translate their religious practices into digital space. And they do that because, you know, life, all of life is becoming mediated. And so why not kind of keep, create the integration? But the co uh, convergence is, is that they don't draw from just one well, as it were. You know, they can, you know, they go one place to get their... Um, it may be their, their, their prayer context and one place to get their information. It's, a, it's kind of the picking and mixing and putting together of this experience in this ritualized space and um, kind of journey that they're on. And the second thing that's related to that is the idea of what I call multi-site reality. So that people's, you know, um, their practice or rituals, you know, we used to we talk, used to talk about, you know, internet is a place we go on to. It's we surf this space. It's an alternative reality. But, you know, for most of my students, especially, you know, Generation Z, they don't see a difference between online and offline relationships. It's just their relationships. And some are more face-to-face -face and some are more mediated. And so basically rituals happen in multiple spaces. You know, maybe today it's, you know, maybe like a month ago I would be involved in an offline meditation group. But now I have to do that, you know, via Zoom because I, we can't meet face-to-face. -face. 
And so, and then, you know, maybe in two months, I'll go back to the face-to-face -face once, you know, things are lifted. So there's this kind of fluid understanding that ritual and religion takes place in multiple places. And it's kind of my spiritual journey that kind of ties them together rather than kind of the structures of an institution. Hmm. Let's talk a little bit about, about hierarchy. Um, when, when I think about traditional religion, um, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, I think about, I think, I think hierarchy and dogma are sort of built into the mix. Um, but the internet seems to flatten it to a certain degree, and it shifts authority um, towards the participants. And you talk a lot about authority in your work. Um, so, I mean, so I guess it's my sense that it, that uh, the internet dilutes the rigid, rigidity of dogma and to some extent flattens hierarchy and allows for more freedom of interaction for participants to define reality as how they choose. What is your sense as to how um, shifting authority um, is, re is, 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 is reflected in, um, in, in digital technology, or people's use of digital technology, I should say. So this idea of kind of what does authority look like in a, a digital age, especially religious authority, something I've been studying for the, la the past decade. Um, and one thing I kind of observed early on was that, you know, people in religious le leadership or institutions, you know, pastors, denominational leaders, imams, you know, their, their leadership is based on you know, a few kind of very concrete things. It's based on, um, you know, either divine or human kind of um, elevation into a certain position. It's about kind of institutional um, authority and knowledge that, that gets in that position. It's about kind of expertise in certain kind of uh, theological uh, and structural things. So it's very much grounded in institutions and communities. My authority comes from outside me kind of saying, you know, uh, I've got this skills, I've got this knowledge, I've got this influence, I'm part of the structure, and that's how I gain authority. Whereas in digital culture, um, scholars have described it as algorithmic authority. So it's basically your involvement online builds this kind of authority. Authority, And some people kind of describe it more as kind of, you know, influence. Um, it, you know, it's the number of likes that you have on your posts. It's the number of followers you have. It's how many people link to your content and so give it some sense of authority and validity. And so, you know, that is it's gained through not religious knowledge, but technological knowledge. It's come from your know, digital fluency, not um, a, a theological fluency. And so you kind of see already kind of traditional leaders versus kind of what I call the digital creatives, religious digital creatives, already at this kind of place of tension because I can actually get influence and authority in a group of people that would be part of a specific tradition or institution or community and actually not have any, you know, credence or influence, you know, they, they're bypassing the gatekeepers. And so we're seeing this kind of interesting negotiation between how do religious leaders actually kind of maybe learn that kind of authority so they can have both, so they, they don't lose their people and their control and how do people you know we actually get these positions some love it and other people feel a bit you know wow I have this influence and I didn't really mean to become an authority figure and how do I kind of negotiate that when I still want to be considered part of my community or institution that's interesting I was reading one of your articles and you you know you talked about um it, it, so I, I can see this contrast between some guy who's like you know or it's usually a guy who he's he he's been studying all this kind of stuff he's like got a phd and all that sort of stuff but maybe he's clueless when it comes to digital interaction on the other hand you got somebody who has maybe no experience or maybe he's read, read a few books or something like that but because he knows how to use the technology he knows how to get likes he knows how to have influence he's got a whole different kind of authority which comes from a whole different channel than this person that that has spent his his or her entire life gaining authority through traditional means. It's quite interesting. Yeah, I describe it in one of, one of the chapters of my new book, which is called Digital Creatives Rethinking Religious Authority. Um, uh, I talk about theologians who blog, so people who are trained theologians, teach in seminaries, and they use the internet as a way to kind of maybe experiment with ideas and kind of reach out to a younger generation to talk about theology, make their theology more popular and accessible. But then there's also the theologians. These are people, they blog about theology. They may or may not have any religious training or not, but they actually may and oftentimes have a larger audience and a larger hearing, and they describe them, or their audience describes themselves as theologians, but they would definitely not tick the box of what, you know, most seminaries, um, divinity schools would kind of um, thing. And so looking at the kind of interest, you know, you know, it does influence and kind of, you know, uh, um, uh, your, your digital footprint, does that inc um, make authority? And, you know, what happens if that authority is not based on truth, you know, the whole <laughs> kind of era? 
Uh, I spent a, a good portion of my career um, sort of preoccupied, I guess I'll, I'll call it, um, with issues of difference, especially like, uh, you know, race, gender, sexual orientation, these kind of things. And I wonder, I'm curious as to what your sense is to, as to how um, the, the influence of the Internet changes um, people's perceptions of these things. Well, I think, you know, one thing is it does, it, again, uh, yeah, the Internet is you know, this kind of this network of networks. And so the whole the traits of the network of it being dynamic, being flexible, being individualized. In many ways, when people kind of interact with that, it kind of creates kind of patterns of communication or expectations of that. They expect kind of, you know, their life to be more dynamic, uh, more um interactive they're willing to draw from from multiple sources and so i think in one respect that we see that you know p people voices that were silenced now have a space to emerge um, that doesn't mean that they have as much influence as maybe traditional um, kind of authorities, but at least they have a space where they can perform. And sometimes they form one of these little communities of saying, hey, let's, you know, um, um, experiment with queer, the queer, queer theology in this, you know, mainline context. Or hey, let's kind of talk about kind of gender issues within, um, you know, the conservative Islamic community. So well, there's these space, spaces that weren't available before to talk about um, these things. Um, but then there's also still, you know, the tension as, you know, religious um, leaders and conversations, you know, sometimes get kind of controlled. And so we, you know, as much as we can have the freedom, we also can have the alternative, either critics or, you know, worst case scenario, you know, hate groups that kind of can you know, use the digital media to bully, um, to, um, to hurt um, and to um, uh, show prejudice against different religious and um, different subgroups. So, you know, both of this is, again, it's, it's a, a double edged sword. <laughs> You know, one of the things that you, you didn't you didn't mention this in particular, but you, you talked about um, um, you kind of alluded to it in a kind of a parenthetical way. Um, it seems that it allows for the emergence of different um, belief structures, as you know, or maybe you don't. I don't know. Um, there's a wise around the world of what's called new religious movements. You know, uh, and maybe they existed before, and I just didn't see them. But you look on Wikipedia. Um, they're all over the place. And it's not just the United States. It's everywhere. It's Asia and Africa are supposedly the main ones. And it seems that the Internet kind of um, facilitates the, the emergence of these different, um, I'll call them alternative um, belief systems. It allows you to find your tribe if your tribe is not, is not, a, not, not you can't find it in your church or something. Or if you can, it's a hidden thing. Yeah, I think that's that's very very true. You know, you, maybe you're the one person in your church that believes in process theology, or maybe <laughs> you're someone that you know that is wanting to have a conversation about you know gender politics and real and, and your religious community, and that might not be welcome in your local faith community. But you know, online it allows whether it's the global UMA or the global body of Christ to be kind of realized, and so you can kind of create your own tribe. And you know, one thing we find is that a lot of people they're still if they're invested in religion online, they typically have some connection offline, and they may even still be active in the church or synagogue or, or whatnot, but it's the online form, that global community, that global conversation that kind of feeds their soul, as it were. And yeah, finding their um, spiritual tribe and their spiritual home is really important for many people online. And they can do that where they couldn't do that before. Now, one of the things I read about a little bit in one of the articles that I read about, uh, that I read, and, and this is like a summary, and it just it's fascinated me. Um, but, you know, and you alluded to that when you, when you started talking about sports fandom, for example. There are some people that they seem to, the, if you actually look at their behavior and you look at behavior of religious people, maybe they're, they're, um, the thing that they're interested in has nothing to do with uh, Christ or any of these kind of symbols or something like that, but you can look at it as religion in a sense. And that comes to the whole conversation of technology itself as religion. And this is not new. People have been looking at this ever since, you know, uh, the Gutenberg and the book, you know, so what's happening in this area? Uh, it's a broad question, I guess, but I'll ask you anyway. Yeah, I, mean, I think one of the questions I'm becoming more, more and more interested in is how does, you know, involvement in the Internet and digital spaces kind of change our understanding of what is religion and what is spiritual? So you're talking about kind of like, you know, what happens when these kind of secular or these non-religious spaces become the space of religion? Um, I live in Texas, and so, you know, football is often described as a religion because you have, it's because it has this larger force that you believe in, you know, the specific team. It has a set of um, 
beliefs, and those beliefs come out in certain kind of rituals of how you cheer, what you do, and so it kind of creates that kind of identity. And, and more and more people are, you know, technology does fill those needs. You know, many people have write, written about how technology is in itself like like magic because it allows us to have these powers that, that to be godlike. You know, other people argue, especially with the, the you know, growing AI and the post-human discourse about us merging with technology and these new human tech forms that we actually not are not are not just having given godlike abilities. We may actually have the abilities that we always attributed to the all powerful, all seeing, you know, all present um, God. And even at the very kind of little uh, uh, um, the basic area, you know, technology becomes an extension of, of humanity. And so people have written about, you know, kind of how it basically changes our sense of what is the spiritual and just what creates kind of connection and meaning for people. So yeah, and that gets, to, that gets to the kind of the meta question that I think underscores your whole field, and that's to what extent does internet and digital technologies, what is it, it raises questions about the nature of human existence itself. Yeah, lots of interesting debates, I think, especially with people talking about, you know, post-humanism, which is the philosophy of that, you know, if we're becoming something more than human, we're merging with technology through AI and virtual reality. What is it? What will it really mean to be human when the robots have human traits and we have so many implants in us? It's hard to tell if we're, you know, uh, meat or metal. <laughs> so, um, so Heidi Campbell, tell me, what are your future direct directions for your, your research? Um, you've you've researched a lot, um, as you say, since 1996. What's what's really fascinates you these days? What are you thinking about studying? Well, my current research project is I've, 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 I was my first um, career was as, as a journalist. And so I've always really focused on ethnography and talking to people. Um, but I've been really come interested in kind of, you know, digital content, especially images. So I've been studying uh, for the last five years, internet memes and looking at what messages about religion do internet memes communicate, especially, you know, the, asking the question, are internet memes about religion mean or caring? You know, can, and if we, if they are mostly mean, which is what, my, my um, uh, myself and my research team are finding that there's a lot of stereotypes that are promoted by internet memes because there are these short, succinct little stories. Um, how do we turn those mean memes into caring conversations? Are memes just going to encourage hate, or can we actually use them to kind of facilitate interreligious dialogue and tolerance? So I'm kind of in the middle of that, and right now I'm collecting a lot of uh, memes about the coronavirus and religion. <laughs> <laughs> It's been fun. Kept me busy the last couple of weeks. Well, that's good. You need to have something to do while you're quarantined. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm going to say goodbye to you for a moment, but let me just tell the listeners or, or the, the viewers a little bit about the about the network and how they can get in touch with us. And then, um, you know, I'll thank you and we'll see where we go, go from here. Um, those of you that are more interested in the network, um, there's lots of ways to get involved with us. The simplest way is to visit our uh, website, uh, sacredinclusion.com. Um, if you really want to know, know more and you want to support the podcast, you can... Um, Find us on Patreon, and you can support us that way. Um, Heidi Campbell, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me, and um, you know it's just been fascinating. I can't wait to see what you come up with next. Thank you. It's been my pleasure to be here. All right.